Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem last stone weight 2. We're given an integer array of stones where the value at the i position represents the weight of the stone. So suppose we're given an array that looks like this. The idea is that we can take any two stones, for example 2 and 7, and smash them together. What will happen when we smash two stones together? Well, either they will be of equal weights. For example, if we smashed one and one together, they're both equal weights. So when we smash them together, we're essentially destroying both of the stones. But if we do that for two stones that are not the same weight, then the larger one will still remain. The smaller one will be completely smashed, but the larger one, we have to subtract from it the weight of the smaller one. We're essentially saying that this stone was partially destroyed. So this one was completely destroyed and this one we subtract two from it. So minus two. So we're left with one stone among these two that has a weight of five now. So that's how we can smash some stones. That's pretty much all we're allowed to do. We can take any two stones and smash them, and we can basically repeat this process as many times as we want. The result will either be, in this case, if we just smash and smash everything, let's say we smash these two together, they're equal weight. We smash these two together. This one was larger, so we have a one left over here. Next, maybe here we smash the two and the four. So we get rid of this and this one is left with a two. And then we smash these two together and we're left with just a one over here. And then we would return one because what we're trying to do here, I just went through it like in a random order, but what we're trying to do is after smashing a bunch of stones, our goal is to minimize the remaining total weight of the stones. Well, total weight, what's going to happen is as we smash stones, we're going to have greater than or equal to two stones left. If we have at least two stones, we can continue to smash the stones together. But if we, maybe we have zero stones, then we can't do anything anymore. And since we're trying to minimize the weight, if we have zero stones remaining, that means we have zero weight remaining, and that's what we would return. The weight that we're trying to minimize is what we're going to return. But there's a last case where we don't have greater than or equal to two stones and we don't have zero stones. What if we just have a single stone remaining? Well, we can't really smash a single stone with itself. And in that case, the weight of that stone would be what we would return, assuming it is the minimum weight. Because as you can see with this example, the way I smashed the stones, we were left with a weight of one, and that is actually the answer for this example. But see how we could have done it a bit differently. We were left with these three values, two, four, and one. What happens if we actually smash the two and the one together? In that case, we would destroy this stone and this stone would have a weight of one remaining. And then we smash this one with this four. This one is destroyed and this one has a weight of three remaining. So that was definitely not the minimal answer that we were looking for. At first glance, you might think that this problem can be solved with brute force, maybe like backtracking or something like that. But even doing this is actually kind of tricky because for every value, for every stone, what's the choice that we have? Well, this stone can either just be left alone or we can smash it with possibly every other stone in the input array. Now, if we do that, things are going to get pretty complicated. It still might be solvable, but things are going to get complicated because we have to manage the state because it's not like when we make a decision for this too, whether to smash it with someone or not, we might still have some weight remaining here. So we'll have to kind of keep track of like the state of the all of the stones, basically. And I'll just tell you that this will not yield the most optimal solution. If you are a little bit clever and actually think about what they're asking of us, there's actually a little bit of a trick going on. And when you get stuck with a problem like this, that's what you should be looking for. Is there some kind of, I call it a trick, but you could also call it a pattern or something obvious that you might be missing. And here the answer is 
We're just trying to minimize the remaining total weight. It doesn't matter if we smash this two with the seven or we smash it with the four. It doesn't really matter because what we're really trying to do is create two piles of stones and we want them to be roughly as equal as possible. I'm trying to draw like those scales. This probably didn't work, but we want to make them as equal as possible. For example, see this array. What's the total sum of the array? Well, I'll just tell you it's 23. So that's the total weight of all the stones. So since it's an odd number, we'll definitely not be able to split it into equal halves. The best we can probably do is get a bunch of stones that weigh 11 and a bunch of stones that weigh 12. So we divide them in this way because when you have these piles, no matter how we smash the stones, no matter how we do it, no matter how this is composed, one, two, three, whatever is here or whatever is over here, it doesn't matter because we're going to find some stones from here and some stones from here and we're going to smash them together. Now, as we smash them, the values might get updated. Maybe now we only have seven over here and maybe over here we only have six, but the difference between them is always going to be one. It's not like I can smash five of the stones from here and then we have a seven left remaining and only smash four stones from here and then have seven remaining. Like That's not possible. When you smash stones from here, you also smash them from there. So it's always going to be possible to continue smashing these until there is zero remaining from one side, at least one side, if they're uneven. So if we have 11 and 12, it will be possible no matter what to get this down to zero. And if we subtract 11 from here, we do the same from here and we're left with one. This will always be possible. And with an even number, it's even better if it's possible for us to divide this into 12 and divide this into 12, then for sure we'll be able to smash all of these rocks and we'll have zero left remaining. So this is kind of our target. We want, no matter what total weight we're given in the array, we want to find at least one pile that we can get as close as possible to the midway point. So for 24, the midway point is 12. That's exactly half. Now with something like 23, we'd probably want to get to 12 for that because that's like the exact midway point but we know that the other pile will have 23 minus 12 so that's 11 so the difference between these will be one that's the lowest we can possibly get but like i said this is just our target it's our goal we might not be able to achieve it now in this example it's definitely possible and there are multiple ways to do it let's say we take this two and these which sum up to 10 so then we have 12 in one pile if we have 12 in one pile that must mean we have 23 minus 12 in the other pile and yep we have 11 in this pile so then we can smash them now the way we're going to code this up we're only going to worry about creating one pile that's equal to half that will simplify things for us a lot because we know if we can get one pile to this then the other pile is going to be pretty close the code is going to be like this. Now that we have turned this problem into a bounded knapsack problem, and if you're not familiar with this pattern, I definitely recommend checking out the advanced algorithms course on neatcode.io. But basically, the idea is that for every value in this input, we can make a choice. Our total sum is initially zero so our total is zero we make a choice to include this two or not include this two if we include it then our total is going to be two if we don't our total is still going to be zero here we have the same choice either include it or don't if we include it with the two then we'll have nine total if we don't include it we'll still have two remaining here if we include it we'll have seven here if we don't we'll still have zero and basically we make this choice for every single value what that will do as we continue down this tree, a single path from the root down to a leaf, this is not a leaf because we would continue going through the entire array making that decision, but one of these paths would represent one 
possible pile. We want among all of these paths, there's going to be a bunch of them. How many? Well, it's going to be two to the power of n because we have n values in the input array. And for each one of them, we can make two choices, either include it or don't include it. So that's how many total possibilities there are. But among all of those, we want the one that gets us the closest to the sum of this divided by two. We want the closest one because that is what's going to minimize the remaining stone weight. Our solution is big O, two to the power of N. Not bad, but is there any repeated work? Maybe we can apply caching to this problem like you can usually with bounded knapsack problems. And in this case, we definitely can. So as we code this function, there's two parameters we're gonna use First of all, we're going to be doing this recursively, as you can kind of visualize here. We're going to be backtracking. We're going to try one approach and then come back up and then maybe try another one. But the main variables we're going to be passing is one I pointer, which is going to tell us what index we're at in the array, like which one of these are we making the decision for. And the second is going to be what is our total so far? Because notice how when we're at this index, we're over here. We have a total of two going down this path. We have a total of two because we chose to include this value. And now from here, we're trying to get as close to 12 as we possibly can because that was our target value. But right now we have a total of two. This path is going to be different from the path over here where we're at the same exact index, but our total so far is zero. We chose to not include this two. And we don't know which one of these paths is going to get us the minimal result, the optimal result that we're looking for. So we have to try both of them. So when we use our cache, we can't just use I, we also have to keep track of what our total is. That's how I'm going to be doing it. An alternative way would be instead of keeping track of what the total is, keep track of how far away we are from the total. So we know our target is 12. So we could just initialize our target to be 12. And then every time we go down these paths, we subtract from this. So from here, instead of being two, we would subtract two from here and it would actually be 10. But I'm going to do it the other way by keeping track of the total. But other than that, this is a pretty standard memoization solution. Now, in terms of the time complexity, our variables are I and the total. So what are the possible values for I? Well, it's going to be N because there's N spots that that index could be. What about the total? Well, it's going to be the sum of the stones array, which I believe does have a bound. I think it's roughly 10,000 or something like that, but it is bounded. So it's not going to be like an insane number in the billions or anything like that. This tells us that our total time complexity is going to be N times whatever the total happens to be, which could be the sum of the input array, because this is how many possible combinations we could have passed into our recursive function. So now let's go ahead and code this up. The memory complexity, by the way, is going to be the same because this is the size of our cache. Okay, so now the first thing that I'm going to do before we even get into the recursion or the caching or anything, I'm just going to get the sum of all of the stones because we're going to need it. So this is the sum of all of them. Now we want our target value, which I'm going to set to the stone sum divided by two, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently than you might think, but it's going to be consistent with the drawing explanation because we're going to take the ceiling of the stone sum divided by two. Because remember, when we were talking about 23, we wanted the halfway point. If we do integer division, then we're going to round down, which would give us 11 after dividing by two. But we want to round up for odd numbers. When we divide 23 by two, we want to round up so we get 12. That's what we want. If we had 24 and divided it by two, well, it's even, so rounding up wouldn't really do anything. So this is how I'm going to do it. Now for our actual recursion, I call it DFS. You can call it what you'd like, but this is a recursive function inside of our outer function so that we don't have to pass in some of these parameters. But the ones that we are going to pass in are going to be the index that we're at i as well as what our total current sum happens to be. Now, I didn't talk much about the base cases. They're not super complicated. One is, what if our total goes 
over the target or what if it's exactly equal to the target well if it's equal to the target that would be great that's about as close as we can get we can probably return at that point if it goes over the target well at that point we're not going to get any closer so we might as well stop we're only going to get further away because all of the stones are a positive weight if the total that we have is greater than or equal to the target, we can return. Now, the other edge case is what if we reach the end of the array? If I is equal to the length of stones, then we also reach the base case. Now, what are we going to return? Because this part is actually kind of tricky because, yeah, we want our total to be as close to the target as possible. But what will actually be the weight? of the remaining stone well remember what if our stone sum is 23 our target is 12 and we actually get a pile of stones that weigh 12 that would mean we have another pile of stones that equal 11 aka 23 minus 12 so what we do down here is we get the total stone sum and then subtract from it our current total so this will give us the other pile we already have our one pile 12 let's say that's the total the other pile will be this which is stone sum minus the total now let's say that's 11 what we want is the difference between these two piles because that tells us what's the remaining stone weight left how do we get the difference between these well we would take the total subtracted by this thing that we just computed, which tells us the other pile. So subtracting these two, taking the difference between them will tell us the remaining stone weight. Now we are also going to wrap this in an absolute value function call. Reason being, even though we have total always being greater than or equal to the target, it's still possible that this could be negative because what if this part of the if statement executed and the total actually wasn't greater than the target. So we do have to wrap this in an absolute value. Otherwise, not too bad. Now the other thing is, what if this value, this input parameters have already been seen before? So if this is already in our DP hash map, then we're going to return the value that we already have stored. This is the caching portion. It won't make a ton of sense, but I guess I'll show you how this is going to be called. We're going to call DFS starting at index zero. Our current total initially is also going to be zero. So that's what we're going to pass in there. But before we call it, we're going to actually create a DP hash map, which this will be able to access because this is defined outside of this method. So this isn't just coming out of nowhere is what I'm getting at. And then we call DFS and DFS is returning the result. So we would just return from DFS, but we're not done with our DFS yet. Let me clean this up now for the actual recursive case, which I showed is actually pretty simple. We're going to call DFS two times. One time we're going to choose to not include the current value. So we're going to run DFS on the next index, but the total is going to remain unchanged. The other case is if we do include the value at index i, which we'd still pass in i plus one, but for the total now we would say that it's the total plus nums, or it's called stones in this case, at index i. So these are the two possibilities. We either include the stone or don't include the stone. One of these is going to minimize the result and we just wanna find which one that happens to be. So we're gonna take the minimum of both of these and we're going to set it equal to DP. We're gonna add it to our cache once we have computed it. So the key that we're using is same as above, I and total. And then we can simply go ahead and return this guy. And that is the entire code. So now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It's got a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.